Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Marco and I work on Sentinel Hub. And today I'm going to give you a short presentation on Earth observation methods and data. So our agenda today is actually going to be in uh, two parts. First of all, we're gonna have some slides where we'll be asking ourselves what is Earth observation in the first place. Then we're going to have an overview of satellites and data and options of how to access and process it. This will follow with some basic remote sensing concepts and then we will have an interactive part with uh, basic data analysis with plenty of examples. And finally conclude with how to do machine learning with EO data. So if we start off with an introduction, this will mostly be a condensed presentation of concepts and an overview of what can be done. Unfortunately, much will be left unsaid due to a lack of time and we will try to not overload you with information. Mostly also it will be from the perspective of what is available on Sentinel Hub. So the idea here isn't really to tell you so much how to do things, but mostly help you help yourself, because there is a wealth of information online from papers to webinars, etc. In general, also these concepts presented do apply even if you do not use Sentinel Hub. But uh, what is Sentinel Hub? It is essentially a satellite imagery service and API, and you can use the APIs to retrieve and custom process satellite data over any area of interest and time range, and this is done from the full archives in a matter of seconds, because no data is pre-processed. So what is Earth observation? Essentially, Earth observation is gathering information about planet Earth. And the context here is satellite-based remote sensing. So why use satellites? They allow you to see the entire Earth regularly, and this includes hard-to-access areas, either they be physically remote, politically remote, etc. Also, lots of data is needed for climate change monitoring and satellites can provide that. You can also see hurricanes all at once and no other method offers this as you see in this example right here. To continue with an overview of satellites, we can roughly split them into two groups. You have optical satellites and radar satellites. Optical satellites will be familiar to most people, I think, because it is essentially like taking a picture from space. Now, since you are in space, you are affected by clouds and you are imaging through the atmosphere. So if you have a look at the top two images, the one on the left, it's slightly blue, it's slightly hazy. Well, that is the atmosphere. So then someone invented the so-called atmospheric correction algorithm, which essentially estimates what the ground would look like without the atmosphere. So that is the atmospherically corrected data. And you can actually access both. Radar is actually very different to optical imagery because uh, it behaves completely differently. It sends its own signal, it receives its signal back and then looks at the difference. Uh, essentially, radar is also unaffected by clouds because it uses a completely different wavelength to optical imaging. And as such, it is much more difficult to master. It requires a much higher learning curve. Another benefit is that it is active, so it basically generates its own light, unlike optical, which require light from the sun, so it can image day and night. Next up, an overview of bands. So bands, which are sometimes called channels, are basically intervals of the electromagnetic spectrum which a detector can see. So you can roughly think of them as colors, and each satellite contains multiple such detectors. So in this image you see the multiple detectors of multiple satellites overlaid over the atmospheric transmission curves. So the first satellite we're going to look at is Sentinel-2. This is actually the most used data on Sentinel Hub, and it's an optical satellite which offers 13 bands. The resolution is typically 10 or 20 meters resolution per pixel, but you also have some bands at 60 meters. ESA also provides scene classification, so essentially telling you what it thinks is on the ground, be it vegetated or built up. And in addition to this, Sentinel Hub offers cloud masks, which tells you which pixels are cloudy for each image. And this is super handy if you're doing data analysis and do not want clouds to interfere. Our next satellite is Sentinel-3. This one actually carries multiple instruments and it's mostly used as an optical satellite. The ULCHI instrument has 21 bands and the SLSTR instrument contains 11 bands and these include thermal infrared. The resolution is about 300 meters per pixel for ULCHI and 500 to 1 kilometers for SLSTR. The main purpose of Sentinel-3 is to detect ocean and land temperature and color changes, but if you have a better idea, feel free to use it. 
Next up, Sentinel-1. This was, as the name implies, the first Sentinel launched, which was in 2014, and this is a radar satellite. The resolution is about 20 meters per pixel for GRD data, and this is provided at 10 meter pixel spacing, and we won't go into detail about what this means. So radar is also inherently noisy, which we call speckle. And as we mentioned previously, the high learning curve is an issue for many users. So that's why on Sentinel Hub, you can actually get an analysis ready data by using select presets. Next is Sentinel 5P. This is an atmospheric monitoring satellite and it can monitor air pollution. So for Sentinel 5P, there are available multiple derived products which measure various atmospheric gases like NO2, O3, CH4, and various cloud properties. And these are derived products because they aren't measured directly, but are computed from what the satellite actually measures using various algorithms. Uh, one nice thing about Sentinel 5P is it offers daily global coverage and the resolution is up to about 5.5 times 3.5 kilometers per pixel. This may not seem like a lot, but it is actually considerably better than previous generation satellites. So for this purpose, the resolution is actually high. Next up are the Landsats. Now the Landsats have a rich history starting in 1972 when Landsat 1 was launched. Landsat data also became free and open in 2008, which means that after 2008 you have regularly intervaled data. While before that you still have data, it's just not as regularly intervaled anymore. Landsats are also optical missions. They also offer thermal bands in the later, but this is not present in the earlier missions. So you can see in the next point, it started with four bands with, uh, with, uh, sorry, with Landsat 1 and continued to about 11 bands with Landsat 8. The resolution has also increased over time from about 80 meters per pixel to about 30 meters per pixel. And of all the satellites we have reviewed and will review, this is most like Sentinel-2. The next useful data you can get is the digital elevation model. So a digital elevation model either tells you the height above sea level or the height above an ellipsoid, and you can actually get both on Sentinel Hub, and it is global. ESA provides the Copernicus DEM. So the Copernicus DEM is either 90 or 30 meters per pixel. It is global, but you can get up to 10 meters per pixel in EEA areas with the license. Also provided is uh, commercial satellite data, and unlike the previous examples, this data is not open because you need to pay for it. And you can order and use it in, on Sentinel Hub on demand. These are optical satellites, and they offer much higher resolutions, up to about 0.5 meters per pixel, and they generally offer four bands, so RGB with one near infrared band. The providers we have are Airbus, Maxar, and Planet. Another fan ha handy feature is bring your own data. So you can use your own raster data on Sentinel Hub, provided some conditions are met, like the image is in TIFF. And uh, once you have done all that, it basically behaves as any other data. So on the right can be anything, like a scene classification map or a probability mask or whatever. So next up, we will have a quick overview of where you can access data and then how to process it. So the most basic are the online viewing tools, Sentinel Hub Playground, Ear Browser. There's also Request Builder, and we'll have a quick look at this in the interactive part. Then the Sentinel Hub API has docs here, which you can use. Uh, finally, there are also libraries, and these are open source, Sentinel Hub Pi and Sentinel Hub JS for Python and JavaScript, which interface to the Sentinel Hub API. For processing data, if you have large areas and or time ranges where you do need a file output, you can use the batch functionality. The benefits are that it is low cost and it is asynchronous. But uh, as of this presentation, only enterprise accounts can use it. The next useful feature is the statistical API. And this calculates statistics only, but without returning satellite imagery, unlike batch. Again, this is programmable and you can basically tell the system what to measure. Uh, and return the values as percentiles, which you determine, or histograms, and you can have this on multiple dates with multiple outputs. Next, an overview of machine learning options. As we previously mentioned, Sentinel Hub Pi, this is basically an open source Python API for Sentinel Hub services. 
And uh, the upgrade of this is actually EOLearn. So this is built upon Sensor Hub Pi and it is mostly done uh, to facilitate your machine learning tasks. The EOFlow is actually additional code for deep learning approaches and this connects EOLearn with TensorFlow. And there's also an, a work in progress, unnamed library right now, which is similar to EOFlow, but this connects EOLearn with the PyTorch framework. So next up are some remote sensing concepts. The simplest concept is the so-called band combination. It is essentially taking satellite band values and placing them into the RGB channels of an RGB image. So for example, if you want a true color image, you just take the RGB channels of your satellite and you place them into the RGB channels of your image. Easy. You can also get a false color image by choosing any other satellite uh, channel in a different order and placing those in the RGB image. So for example, the image on the top right is a false color image. Next up is the concept of indices. Indices are essentially functions on bands. So you can have as many bands as inputs. An index will return a single value as the output. And the most well-known index is the normalized difference vegetation index with the formula as on the slide. So NDVI is the near infrared value minus the red value divided by the sum. And uh, in general, there are many indices and uh, they're available on the index database, which we will show you a little later. Then the last concept is the concept of a custom script. This is essentially a Sentinel Hub concept. And these allow you to define mappings from your input data to your output data, whatever that is. So uh, this also means you can have different dates, you can have data fusion, which means you can have different uh, sensors all in the same script. And you can combine all this into any output combination you want. It's essentially a single pixel based uh, a single pixel based approach. So you can't do convolution, but you can do pretty much anything else. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go into custom scripts, but you do have a one hour webinar just on this topic. So we will just mention these mostly as concepts and then show you examples. To start off with the interactive part of this presentation, let's have a look at Sentinel Hub Playground. So basically, this is the simplest uh, viewer we have the easiest way to view and get data, and it's very interactive. You can just move around, zoom in, zoom out, you name it. Uh, you can also choose different dates, so you just click here. Let's go back to months, and you get data from that date. If you want to switch, you can also switch to, for example, Sentinel-1, you click here. This is Sentinel-1, but let's go back to Sentinel-2. So over here you have different uh, options for rendering. This is the standard and true color. Here we have the standard false color. And here are visualized indices. So this is the vegetation index, but with a color mapping. This is also a moisture index, also with a color mapping. Finally, if you want to customize these visualizations, you can just click the custom button here and uh, the simplest offer here is to just use band combinations. So if you want true color, you just uh, drag in the right bands. But if you want something else, you can do that as well. Finally, if you click here, you have the option to use custom scripts. Now, what custom scripts? Let's just uh, keep things simple. Let's just go to the custom scripts repository. This is right here. This is something we provide and it provides a list of various custom scripts which people use. So down here you have the relevant reading section. There's lots of information about uh, what scripts one can use, what scripts uh, are being used, and what you can do with them, best practices and so on. Mm, but in general, if you're interested in some scripts, you can just uh, click here for example. Let's just go to Sentinel-2. And here, have, here you have a list of uh, scripts which are useful in one way or another. So if we just start off with some simple remote sensing indices and just pick one. So let's just click GNDVI. You have multiple options. You can just uh, show the script. You can copy paste this into Playground. Click refresh. And this will show you this value. As you can see, this is actually 
returning an index. It's not visualized, so that's why it's grayscale. But in general, if you're interested in more indices, there's a collection of remote, senses, remote sensing indices from the index database. So you can just click here, and you have a lot of these, which you can use directly. And these are the ones which are present on the index database. So this is the index database. If you're interested in various applications, you can just click around. In general, if you're interested in a list of available indices, they're also right here with the formulas. Also offered are references, so if you click here, you get a list of uh, references for this index. So you can really just uh, use these to maybe get some ideas about what to do with your data. So this roughly covers uh, Sentinel Hub Playground. Now if we move on to EO Browser, this is right here. Uh, we will not be getting into details about all the features of your browser because there is also a one-hour webinar just for this uh, application itself. But in general, you can think of it as an advanced Samsung Hub Playground. And we will be showing you an example of simple change detection. So it's actually really easy. There are some highlights. Oops. Let's go through change detection through time theme. And there's some highlights here. So if we just click here. We're looking at Egypt in 1984, and if we'll just quickly add this to compare, and then going to Egypt in 2019, and add this to compare. Then you can slide this around. You can see that you can use uh, your browser for some very easy change detection. So basically, this is 35 years of difference, and it's pretty obvious that things have changed. So for our next ear browser example, we will actually be showing you an example of flooding. Uh, so this, uh, this area, which uh, we have already set up, is uh, actually Lake Cerknica. It is a well-known intermittent lake in Slovenia, and we will use it to showcase flooding, as well as show you the difference between uh, how these, uh, uh, these applications for Sentinel-2 as well as Sentinel-1. So over here, we have uh, basically Lake Cerknica, and we're actually going to switch to the shortwave infrared combination because uh, it highlights water rather well. So over here we have the time-lapse tool. So we'll just click here. And uh, let's just, uh, just move in time forward a few months. So let's just go to the end of March from roughly the beginning of January. Let's just uh, get all the images. And then here we have a time lapse already set up. So if we click play, you can see there is something going on, but there are a lot of clouds. So you can see that uh, optical imagery does work well, but you do need uh, clear skies, especially as this was uh, in the winter where uh, this part of the world is rather cloudy. So let's just stop this for a moment and switch to the Sentinel-1 time-lapse. Now we already have this set up, so it's roughly the same time frame. So from the beginning of January to the end of March. However, this time we'll be using Sentinel-1 since it, uh, it can see through clouds. So if we do the same, you can see that uh, there are no issues with clouds and that the lake nicely floods and then it nicely recedes over time. So Sentinel-1 is a really great application for, for flood monitoring because of that. Now you might be asking why this works. Essentially water or still water, so water which isn't too rough, it acts as a mirror for radar waves. So uh, since uh, the satellite images from the side, it basically just bounces off. That's why the, the wet areas are, are nice and dark. Our next example will be to showcase wildfires. So over here we have a wildfire open in EO browser. 
and you can see that uh, the true color image does give you an idea of uh, which areas are burning. But of course, this is not the only information you can get. So just by switching to false color, it becomes a bit more obvious that this area had something going on, even though it's maybe not completely clear uh, from the true color image. Next up is the atmospheric penetration preset, which is quite amazing because uh, it uses the shortwave infrared bands to see through the to see through the smoke. It also highlights the various uh, hot spots uh, as bright areas. So essentially, let's not uh, let's not forget where we're actually viewing here. So these are not necessarily fires actually burning. This might simply be uh, residual heat from areas which used to burn, but then again, they might be active fires. So this might be a good candidate over here. Uh, then also useful are the various uh, indices. So if you just click on moisture index, it becomes pretty obvious which, uh, which parts are fine and which parts were burned, as well as the normalized burn ratio index, which, uh, which does something similar. We have a quick look at NTVI. It's actually not as obvious as the other ones. Then finally, there's this uh, wildfire preset here, which uh, looks quite like the true color image. It just uh, it just just cheats a bit by taking the shortwave infrared bands to highlight these areas in the image. But again, as we previously mentioned, this isn't uh, necessarily fire on the ground. These could just be uh, residual heat, as spots with, uh, with heat. So this is, uh, this is pretty much uh, wildfire monitoring using uh, Sentinel-2, but it might be interesting if we actually switch to Sentinel-5P because this is the air quality satellite. So let's just switch to the aerosol index and choose the same date. So this was in July, I think, 2020. Yeah, so you can see that uh, something is up. And uh, if we switch to a more obvious example, these are actually the California wildfires from late summer of 2020. So we have this already set up as a time lapse, and you can see that uh, that uh, the aerosols, which uh, Sentinel 5P can measure really, uh, really become massive. So you can see the wildfire starts, it burns, there's quite a bit of aerosols, and then it just, uh, it just explodes. And it covers the whole of the United States as well as Canada and other countries. So it's really, it's really massive. We would also like to briefly take the opportunity to showcase the ESA race website, which essentially is a website which shows the impact of COVID-19 as seen by various satellites. So Sentinel-5P being an air pollution satellite was uh, definitely used to monitor air pollution during the pandemic. And uh, it was used to see how, uh, how much pollution levels dropped. So you could get more information here. In our next example, we would like to show you the Ulysses Water Quality Viewer. And this was actually submitted by the community through our custom scripts contest. So if we just have a quick look at the script, you can see this is a pretty serious custom script for obvious reasons, because there was uh, quite a lot of science behind it. So uh, the Ulysses Water Quality Viewer, in essence, will visualize these values. So chlorophyll and sediment. And put this into a simple uh, way that it can be human viewable. It's also parameterizable, and uh, there's lots of scientific and technical background, which is uh, all explained here, uh, as well as uh, an example.
But in essence, let's just have a quick look at it uh, in EO browser, which we can do by clicking here. So let's have a look at Lake Balaton in EO browser. Give this a moment to load. And yeah, this is the Ulysses Water Quality Viewer on this date. We can switch dates. Let's see what happens. Yeah, you get a different uh, water quality. The next example is uh, the Tracking Radar Vegetation Index, which is actually another uh, script from the community. And this one is interesting because it actually calculates a kind of uh, radar vegetation index uh, without using any optical data. So uh, it's also a um, multi-tumble script. So in the sense that it combines different uh, dates to get its data. And over here you have a general description and uh, over here an example. So uh, basically it, uh, it classifies according to color. And uh, you can play around with this in uh, Sensor Hub Playground. So uh, here we have it preloaded. It takes a little bit longer to load since it is uh, multiple months of data. Mm, so we already have this open. But in essence, the different colors do tell you something. And since this is radar, there are no issues with clouds. So this is another tool you can use to get uh, information from the ground. Our next example in EO browser will showcase uh, commercial data. So this, uh, this area in, uh, in Africa, uh, Dakar, has been uh, selected for the Urban Growth in Africa contest. And uh, lots of data has been prepared in advance for you. And this includes all the commercial data providers. So if we start off with a look at uh, Sentinel-2 data, and for example, just zoom in here, you can get a feel of uh, the resolution of Sentinel-2. But uh, actually, let's, uh, let's add this to compare. But if we're interested in the commercial data, so let's say Airbus Pleiades, and I think we need to go back in time. Yeah. So we can have a look at uh, the resolution of commercial data. So let's also add this to compare. So in addition to commercial data, this uh, part also has uh, the Sentinel-1 GRD process to analysis ready level. So if you're interested, you can have a look at that as well. So let's just pick one randomly and then add this to compare as well. So this will showcase a few different, uh, different uh, satellites in the same area. So this is Sentinel-2. This is commercial data. So let's just zoom in more and maybe even reorder this a bit. Yeah. So you can see that Sentinel-2 was processed to about 20 meter resolution. This is about 10 meter resolution for Sentinel-1. And finally, if we have a look at the commercial data, which is at 0 0.5 meters resolution, you can see this is a whole different uh, world of detail, which might be useful for you in your applications. But essentially, this is uh, part of the urban earth, uh, sorry, the urban growth in African contest. So there is actually a website here and we would actually like to use this opportunity to invite you to this because uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can apply. So this, uh, this uh, has uh, a custom script contest. Basically the idea is for you to uh, make sense of all this data or try to make sense of all this data and the person with the best custom script actually wins some nice prizes. So this is all on this website. Uh, you have time until July the 25th and uh, you can easily use this, uh, this data to play around. The last example we would like to quickly show you is uh, an example of data fusion. So basically where you combine Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 
And the idea here is uh, to use Sentinel-1 to infill areas where Sentinel-2 is covered by cloud. So it will use a form of radar vegetation index uh, to approximate the NDVI index values using Sentinel-2. So over here you have it on the custom script repository as usual. You have some uh, standard descriptions and examples. So basically this is the area, how it looks like using Sentinel-2. And this is uh, the NDVI value. Of course, uh, these areas with clouds are suspect, so not values you want to use. Mm, so use the cloud masks to remove these areas. And then you can use data fusion functionality of Sentinel Hub to infill this with the red radar vegetation index, which approximates NDVI. So over here, we have the same thing open in your browser. Uh, we won't go over the custom script, but basically, this is a slightly more advanced option for you to use the functionalities of uh, remote sensing data to make sense of, uh, of what is going on on the ground. So that concludes the basic data analysis uh, examples. Uh, now we'd like to point you to the education pages we have with, uh, with uh, much more information about uh, satellite imagery and what you can do with it. So this is our education page. Over here you have uh, multiple tutorials, how to make time lapses, some index tool, and various use cases. So mon monitoring air pollution, having a look at uh, the Mount Etna eruption, wildfires, and uh, various user guides, including webinars. There's also more uh, resources here. Uh, so this is uh, the education page. The next one we want to show you is the industries and showcases. So these are examples basically uh, more targeted to the various industries. So more for agriculture, land change detection, and so on. Also disaster management and uh, the insurance industry, which you might be interested in. Uh, so these are these websites. So next up, we would like to show you the Sentinel Hub Request Builder. This is basically an online application which allows you to uh, do Sentinel Hub API requests. It, uh, in general, has everything you need in one place. So it's great for, let's say, advanced prototyping or things like that where uh, uh, where you don't want to use EO Browser, for example. Um, but in general, it's it's really easy to use. You just uh, you just plug in all these values here, which you need. You can change them without a problem. So let's just use band eight instead of band two. And then you can send this and get an image. So there you go. And this uh, this is actually true for all the Sentinel Hub uh, APIs. So you can use it to make batch requests, to order third-party data. And there's the catalog service, which uh, gives you information about uh, what satellite imagery is available when, and uh, the statistical API for calculating statistics, which uh, you define. So if we move on to the last part of our presentation today, this is uh, basically how to use machine learning with uh, EO data. And uh, the first thing we would like to briefly show you is the Sentinel Hub Python package. So basically this is an open source uh, package, uh, which is uh, in Python obviously, and uh, it uh, allows you to make API requests to Sentinel Hub using it. So there is much documentation here in the read the docs. It uh, will give some information about uh, installation, configuration, basically everything you need to know to set up. And uh, there's also a ton of examples which will help you get started. So if you're just interested in, for example, a true color on a specific date, uh, it will tell you how to set up. So basically your eval script, your various parameters, and then uh, you, can just, uh, you can just run this and you get your image. Uh, in addition to this, there are other useful tools available. So for example, the large area utility, this will allow you to split up your requests into bounding boxes which are manageable because you can't make an infinitely large uh, area request. And this is useful if, uh, for example, you're not using batch. If you are using batch, you can also use the, the batch processing API, which is also part of uh, Sentinel Hub Pi. It's just, uh, it's just really useful to, to get data. Uh, but in general, if you want to 
if you want to run uh, proper machine learning, so to say, uh, then we get to the eolearn package. So this is the eolearn package. This is built upon Sentinel Hub Pi. It, its uh, main purpose is for preparing data for machine learning. And the idea is to help you bridge Earth observation data with machine learning. So basically, eolearn uses NumPy arrays to store and handle remote sensing data, which can then be fed to machine learning software. And uh, basically, this is the eolearn website, which you can use to learn how to do this. So there are extensive docs. You can see there are also the, the blogs and papers section. So there are a lot of uh, resources you can use to help you cover various examples and see how things are done. Or of course, uh, if you want to do things differently, that's also fine, but this is a good starting point. Then if we, if we just go for a quick overview of eolearn, basically it's, uh, these are the four concepts we will just briefly cover. So what is an EO patch? It's basically a data object for multi-temporal remote sensing data for a single area. If you think of it as data you're interested in, then it's an EO patch. Uh, then if we continue to EO task, basically an EO task is, um, is something which functions on uh, EO patches. So basically it takes in an EO patch and uh, it returns an EO patch. So you have different options basically. You can, uh, you can definitely write your own EO patch. Sorry, you can definitely write your own um, EO task to modify EO patches in any way you want. Of course you can always use uh, pre-built EO tasks. So here are a bunch of EO tasks which are part of eolearn and these are things which uh, are already implemented and uh, things you can use out of the box, so to say. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, if you want to write your own, you can definitely do that. Uh, eolearn is open source. If you want to make something useful and want to push it, you're also welcome to do that. So um, that uh, very briefly covers the EO task. So basically EO workflow, it's basically a graph of EO task objects, uh, which, uh, which you define. Uh, this is essentially things you want to do on your EO patches. And then finally, EO executor does the actual processing. So um, you have that here. Uh, if we continue to just mention EO flow, EO flow is a, you could say it's another package built upon um, eolearn and the idea is to help you make uh, data ready for tensorflow so basically to get data into tensorflow so you can use it for deep learning now if we go to a quick example in uh, in eolearn so a simple one it's basically for measuring the water levels of uh, various dams or water bodies, you could say, but this is an example of this uh, dam in South Africa. I won't even pretend to be able to know how to pronounce. So it, uh, it's, a basic, it's essentially a whole uh, workflow for how to do this. Uh, you, in essence, basically um, import the polygons of the areas. Then you have uh, uh, methods to create uh, EO tasks. And this is all available here. Uh, of course, this is just one example, uh, and uh, if you want to look at this in more detail, for example, uh, you, this is the website. This is the Blue Dot Water Observatory. If you click on the dashboard, you actually have uh, the output of the previous example all on this website, and this is actually for water bodies worldwide. So for this, this example, it's in Turkey, the water level seems to be pretty constant. But if we let's just go to some random uh, water body in Africa, then apparently things are slightly different. And you can click around and see what happens. So this essentially uses the code we just looked and uh, these are the outputs of this 
on this website. Uh, then the next thing we would briefly like to show is the EOLearn workshop. So this is um, pretty much a walkthrough of how to use EOLearn in your applications. Uh, to, to be blunt, this is somewhat dated, but this will be updated in the next months for, um, for new challenges. So you can definitely use this. Uh, just keep in mind uh, to um, to keep in mind that uh, this might not be as up to date as one might want. But essentially, if you click here, you can launch the eLearn tutorial. This will take a bit of time to load, but essentially, all you need is uh, your browser, and uh, you can play around with it in here. So let's see, notebooks. Yeah, so eLearn Basics. And you, here you have a nice uh, tutorial about how to use eLearn to get um, to get your data set up in such a way that you can use machine learning. Here's also an example for uh, the land use cover predictions for Slovenia. This basically has everything you need for. Uh, for you to be able to to do this and there are definitely uh, blog posts about this but this is essentially the code you can use to to get to the same results in essence uh, for let's say for insurance purposes we expect you to want to use uh, these uh, these libraries so basically Sentinel Hub Pi and eLearn as they will uh, allow you to easily assess lots of data at once, build your probability models and whatnot, and then hopefully get uh, some useful information out of this. So hopefully it wasn't too much information, hopefully it wasn't too little. So that, uh, that concludes things. Uh, thank you and uh, goodbye and good luck.